Let us come before the Lord. Gracious God, we do pray that you will breathe on us your breath. Through these 66 love letters you've given us, you, as we turn to your word, Lord, open our hearts and our minds and our spirits, quiet any anxieties that we might have, that we might hear your still small voice. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to turn to the ninth chapter of Matthew's gospel this morning. Begin with the 18th verse. While Jesus was saying these things to them, a synagogue official came and bowed down before him and said, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hands on her and she will live. Jesus got up and began to follow him, and so did his disciples. And a woman who had been suffering from a hemorrhage for 12 years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak. For she was saying to herself, If I only touch his garment, I will get well. But Jesus, turning and seeing her, said, Daughter, take courage. Your faith has made you well. At once the woman was made well. When Jesus came into the official's house, he saw the flute players and the crowd in noisy disorder. And he said, Leave, for the girl is not dead, but is asleep. And they began to laugh at him. But when the crowd had been sent out, he entered and took her by the hand, and the girl got up. This news spread throughout all the land, and Jesus went from there as two blind men followed him, crying out, Have mercy on us, son of David. And he entered the house. The blind men came up to him, and Jesus said to them, do you believe that I am able to do this? And they said to him, Yes, Lord. And he touched their eyes, saying, It shall be done to you according to your faith. And their eyes were opened, and Jesus sternly warned them, See that no one knows about this. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Jesus was hot. Four healings and a resurrection in a very short time. I'm sure there were high fives all over the place and cheering and everything else. No, I really don't think that was the case. Jesus did his work in a very humble manner. The disciples and the others were in awe, the scripture tells us, of what he was doing. They weren't high-fiving and saying, man, we really got it going now. Jesus' ministry at this point in the ninth chapter was in full swing. And in chapter 3, he was baptized. In chapter 4 was his wilderness experience and the calling of many of the disciples. And chapters 5 through 7 were the Sermon on the Mount. Crowds were beginning to follow. They were curious. They were seeking. Some were looking for a show. Some were threatened. Others were really seeking truth and healing. In the beginning of this ninth chapter, he tells the parable, or he tells many parables, but he, a paralytic was healed. After he told the parable, he said, Take courage, your sins are forgiven. Rise and take up your bed. In the eighth verse, we see that we're told that the crowds saw this and were awestruck and glorified God who had given such authority to men. He had called Matthew, and he was still in Matthew's house when we see today's scripture. He's teaching them. He was actually asking questions about fasting is what that first, when he was saying these things, refers to. And all of a sudden, in barges, this synagogue official, Scripture says he bowed down before Jesus. Even though he was an official in the synagogue, he saw something. His daughter had died. And he saw something in Jesus. 
And he said, but come and lay your hands on her, and she will live. Not that she might live or that I hope she lives. She will live, he said. Mark and Luke identify this man as Jairus, who was a, an official in charge of the administration of the synagogue and the synagogue school. He was risking his job and his standing in the synagogue and in the community by bowing before Jesus. But hey, this was his daughter. He was desperate, full of grief and sorrow. He was almost begging, come and lay your hands on her. But then in great faith, he says, she will live. He was grieving and desperate, certainly, but apparently filled with faith and some hope. Not a hope that fades and disappoints, but as the hymn says, a hope that is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness, although Jesus' blood had not been shed by then. He decided to wholly lean on Jesus' name and take his stand on Christ, the solid rock. Lay your hand on her and she will live. His faith was up front for everyone to see. There's no evidence that Jesus even hesitated. It says he got right up and they headed to this guy's house. Now, as I said, he was attracting quite a crowd. So imagine this entourage moving down the street, the disciples and all these other people saying, wow, is he really going to do this? Oh, wow, let's go see. And there might have even been some pushing and shoving. In fact, you could imagine Jarius maybe even dragging Jesus. Come on, come on. You know, she's not getting any livelier here. Dead is dead, and things happen after you die, and we don't want them to happen. There was probably a lot of buzzing among the people about what was going to happen. Suddenly, I think, Jesus stops. And you can imagine this big entourage of people, and Jesus stops, and they kind of go, and compress together as they're moving. Someone had touched Jesus' cloak. Jesus felt some energy. And here in the midst of all these people in the middle of the street was this woman who had been bleeding for 12 years. In Jewish law, she was unclean. She couldn't be associated with, she couldn't be touched because in her bleeding, she was considered unclean. She was desperate enough to push through the crowd and to touch Jesus' cloak. If only I touch his garment, I will get well, she said to herself. Imagine Jarius can, come on, Lord, you know, she can wait. Twelve years, she's not getting any livelier. Let's go. And yet Jesus stopped and with probably more compassion than this woman had ever seen in his life, in her life, excuse me, Jesus said, daughter, take courage. Your faith has made you well. Jesus knew her heart, she knew her needs, and she met her. He met her right where she was. Off they went again, probably Jairus dragging Jesus down the street. Come on, that was one stop. We can't make any more. They got to Jairus' house. The mourners were already there. In those days, they would hire mourners to come in and play flutes and make all kind of Awful noise, if you will. It wasn't pleasant because grieving was not pleasant. And the mourners were all gathered there doing their job. And Jesus said, get out. She's not dead. She's asleep. And they laughed at him. Now, I can imagine the disciples kind of stepping back a little bit. They didn't want to get hit by the lightning bolts that were going to come down and fry these people. But the people did leave. He chased them out and went in and he took her hand and raised her from the dead. And of course the scripture said this news spread very quickly. It was the faith and persistence of the father that brought Jesus to this place where he could touch her and make her whole. Now two blind men had heard of, about all this and they followed Jesus saying, have mercy on us, son of David. And son of David, of course, was the name that, of the coming Messiah. They recognized, even in their blindness, who he was. They followed him into the house, and Jesus asked him a very poignant question. Do you believe that I can do this? 
And they answered very briefly, yes, Lord. No eloquent speeches, just yes, Lord. Then Jesus said, be it done to you according to your faith. And the scripture tells us their eyes were opened. Kind of a scary statement, be it done to you according to your faith. There are days when if it was done to me according to my faith, not a whole lot would get done. But they had faith, they believed, just as, just as uh, Jarius and the woman also. Faith was the key to the healing and, and to salvation. God is faithful even when I may not be faithful. Someone once said that consistent persistence demands response. A consistent Persistent faith demands response. The story is told of a tightrope walker, you may have heard it, who stretched his line across Niagara Falls. And he gets up and takes his stick and goes all the way across Niagara Falls and back. And the crowds cheer and, hey, this is great. You're, you're just great. Do it again. Do it again. So he gets a wheelbarrow. He takes a wheelbarrow across and back. And, oh, man, they're loving it. And he puts weight in the wheelbarrow and he takes it across and back. And, and it's, oh, you're so great. Hey, keep it up. Boy, this is great. great, great. And he said, how many believe that I could take a man across and back? Hey, that be uh, we believe, we believe. Uh, who would like to get in the barrel? Silence. Faith uh, sometimes has its limits, at least worldly faith. Our former pastor years ago, Chuck Klotzberger, equated, and I'm sure he got it from somewhere else, faith and pregnancy. He said that faith and pregnancy are alike. There's no almost pregnant or partially pregnant. You either are or you aren't. You either are faithful or you're not. He said that faith and pregnancy are both a present condition based on a previous act with the hope of a glorious outcome. As I said, faith is a total commitment. There's a uh, story also or the illustration of a pig and a chicken walking down the street. And they see this family hungry. And the chicken says, or the pig says, we need to do something for this family to help them out. And the chicken says, yeah, we, we can give them a ham and eggs breakfast. And the pig says to the chicken, for you, that's a donation. For me, it's a total commitment. But this is what faith is. Hebrews is called Hebrews 11, is the faith chapter in the Bible. Too many markers. It starts out with these words, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, and the conviction of things not seen. And then it goes on to list, by faith Abel, by faith Enoch, by faith Noah, by faith Abraham, by faith Sarah, and Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph, and Moses, and they passed through the Red Sea by faith, and the, by faith the walls of Jericho fell. On and on and on. Then we get to chapter 12, and the writer tells us to put aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily ensnares us. Turn with endurance the race set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. In Ephesians, Paul tells us, For grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourself, it is a gift of God, and <clears throat> not as a result of works that no one should boast. By grace we have been saved through faith. Faith is a gift given to us by God. It is a gift we do not deserve and cannot earn, but we can certainly exercise it. And we must exercise that faith to keep it strong. We do that with daily Bible study, with Sunday school and church. Bringing all that we have before Jesus, our dreams, our hopes, our aspirations, our weaknesses, our 
frailties, our failures, and our faults. Lay them before the throne. Here I am, we tell Jesus. I can no longer do it on my own. As the hymn says, melt me, mold me, fill me, use me <clears throat> for your eternal purpose. Do I really believe what he says is true? Do I really believe that he can do this? Am I willing to get into the wheelbarrow and allow him to take me across the falls? When we walk and run and sometimes are dragged through, through the realities of our lives, realities that attempt to confuse us and shake us, shake our beliefs and sometimes even destroy us, we turn to Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of our faith, and say as he did to the blind men, I believe that you're able to do this. Why? Because God gave us faith to do this work. Dr. John DeBrine, who had a radio show called Song Time years ago, used to say, God said it. I believe it. That settles it. The blind men, the synagogue official, and the woman had heard of Jesus. They believed and they took bold action. Jesus touched them, touched their lives, and great miracles were a result of their faith. Myra Brooks Welsh wrote this poem. She says, "'Twas battered and scarred in the auctioneer, thought it scarcely worth his while to spend much time on the old violin, but he held it up with a smile. What am I bid for this old violin? Who'll start the bidding for me? A dollar? Dollar two? Who'll make it three? Three dollars once, three dollars twice, going, going, but no. From the room far back, a gray-haired man came forward and picked up the bow, wiping the dust from the old violin and tightening the loose strings. He played a melody, pure and sweet, sweet as the caroling angel sings. The music ceased, and the auctioneer, in a voice that was quiet and low, said, what am I bid for this old violin, as he held it up with the bow? A thousand dollars. Who'll make it two? Two thousand. Who'll make it three? Three thousand once. Three thousand twice. Going, going, and gone, said he. The people cheered, but some of them cried. We don't quite understand what changed its worth. Came the swift reply, the touch of the master's hand. And many a man with life out of tune is battered and scattered with sin, an auction cheap to the thoughtless crowd, much like the old violin. A mess of pottage, a glass of wine, a game, and he travels on. He's going once. He's going twice. He's going and almost gone. But the master comes, and the foolish crowd never can quite understand the worth of a soul and the change that's wrought by the touch of the master's hand. Myra Brooks Welsh. Two things are needed for faith in our lives. One, the touch of the master's hand. And two, trusting that he can do what he says he can do. Jesus will not come again to touch the earth the way he did. He will not come again to walk amongst us, to teach us, to heal us, to encourage us. First Thessalonians tells us this. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and with a voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. Any present faith not based on the previous act of Jesus' life and death and resurrection has no hope of the glorious outcome of God's kingdom. We continually are touched by the Master's hand. Our faith has made us well and saved us, but what next? Well, we are 
to go out and touch the world. Later on at the end of chapter 9, Jesus says this, Seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed. And, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore beseech the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. We are to go out and be part of God's great harvest. Dr. John Maxwell once said the things he had learned in dealing with people for many, many years, one of the biggest truths was that no one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. No one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. Our focus needs to be on Christ first and others second. Someone once said, the only Christ that some may ever see is the Christ they see when they look at me. Does my life and do my actions point to the resurrected Christ? The only opportunity some may have in this world of meeting Jesus and of knowing his salvation, being touched by him and healed by the touch of his master hand, the only opportunity they may have of being assured of a place in God's kingdom is the Christ they see when they look at us. This is an awesome responsibility. But it's not our job to change hearts. It's our job to introduce them to the one who can change their heart. Romans 12, 1 and 2 tells us that we are to present ourselves as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to the Lord, the author and perfecter of our faith. The only trouble with a living sacrifice is that it keeps squirming off the altar. We don't always remain on that altar sacrificing ourselves before the Lord. God promises to lead us. He promises to guide us. He promises to give us opportunities. But the master comes and the foolish crowd never quite can understand the worth of a soul and the change that's wrought by the touch of the master's hand. Gracious God, you've given us so much. Give us the courage and the strength and the faith to be the people of your harvest, to be those that go out and collect the harvest that you have provided in Jesus' name. Amen.